Well, welcome to Sunday School on the Go from the First Baptist Church in Tallahassee. I'm Jim Glass, one of the teachers in the Pairs and Spares class. And in our new quarter of Bible study on this third Sunday of March, it's my privilege to lead you through a brief overview of the first of the Apostle Paul's two letters to the followers of Christ in the ancient city of Thessalonica. Last week, we began our look at chapter 2, where we heard about Paul's defense of his ministry there, as well as an encouragement to them and to us to live a life worthy of God who called them and who called us into His kingdom and His glory. This week, in the remaining verses of chapter 2, Paul will return to his words of thanksgiving for the believers in Thessalonica that he began back in the first chapter, celebrating their faithful endurance in the face of intense persecution and sharing with them the reasons for his great desire to see them again. In verse 13 of chapter 2, Paul returns to his thoughts of gratitude to God that he began in the second verse of the first chapter when he wrote, We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. After he reflected on how that faith, love, and hope were so wonderfully seen and felt by those whose hearts God had touched through their proclamation of the gospel, Paul changed direction for a moment to address some of the apparent rumors about him, his ministry, and his fellow workers that might have been circulating in Thessalonica. Through it all, he made it plain that he had been faithful to his calling as an apostle, and they could readily testify of the powerful effects of his ministry among them. Because God was calling them into his own kingdom and glory, verse 12, he is so very grateful, so grateful in fact, that he offers a second insight into his continuous prayers of thanksgiving in verse 13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost." Because, Paul says, it is God who called them to his kingdom. He thanks God that they received his words, not as man's word, but God's word. In spite of the slanderous rumors that the Thessalonian Christians had heard about Paul and his fellow workers, they knew better. They had heard Paul's words, but it wasn't his words alone that had produced such a profound change in their lives. It was the Holy Spirit who brought about their conversion, and with such great assurance that they knew what they were hearing from Paul were not words of some man's imagination, not words of manipulation or flattery or empty philosophies. They recognized and accepted Paul's message for what it was, the Word of God. And their acceptance of the Word of God was confirmed by the work that the Word accomplished in their lives. Well, what work did the Word accomplish in their lives? It caused them to abandon their sins and turn to the Lord. It motivated them to love Him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and show them how great their sin was and how greater still was their redemption, purchased by the blood of God's own Son, shed on Calvary's cross. It gave them great hope because of Jesus' resurrection that assured them of their own resurrection. As they waited in eager expectation for the Lord to return so they could be where He is, the work that the Word accomplished enabled them to endure the trials and tribulations that they faced from those around them. Like the seed that fell on good soil in Jesus' parable recorded for us in the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel, the Word of God among the Thessalonians yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some a hundredfold. Note that Paul says the Word of God performs its work in you 
who believe. When Paul had been in Thessalonica, he had preached the Word of God, but not everyone who heard it received it. Not all who listened to Paul's message were saved. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews tells us about God's Sabbath rest that comes only to those who place their faith in the Lord's finished work of salvation when he writes, Since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Lots of people heard the gospel in Thessalonica, and lots of people hear the gospel today. Someone could spend his entire life in church hearing the Word of God, but it's only when that hearing is combined with faith that it has any eternal effect. The Thessalonians heard, and many of them believed, evidenced by the effectual work of the gospel in their lives that everyone saw. As one commentator aptly notes, if we have really welcomed the divine message, it will not be inoperative. It will work within us all that is characteristic of New Testament life, love, joy, peace, hope, patience. These are the proofs of its truth. Here, then, is the source of all graces. If the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, if the truth of the gospel, deep, manifold, inexhaustible, yet ever the same, possesses our hearts, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. And what did Paul say was the visible evidence that verified the fact that they had indeed received the Word of God for what it really is, as it completes its work in those who believe? Verse 14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. Paul returns to the thought of verse 6 in the first chapter, where he celebrated the Thessalonian believers' imitation of him and the Lord Jesus, as they endured persecution with joy. What was it about them that was identical to the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea? It wasn't that they were founded on the same model of church organization or that they claimed to hold to the same traditions established by those churches, but that they were being treated in the same way as the churches in Judea. They had been persecuted in the same way and by the same people, unbelieving Jews, and they had borne their persecutions with the same spirit of joy. Paul's objective was to comfort and encourage them by showing them that others had been treated in the same manner and that it was to be expected that a true church would be persecuted by those unbelieving Jews who thought their religion was being corrupted by these followers of Jesus. They shouldn't think that God was punishing them for somehow failing to be the church and the people He had called them to be or that something rare and unusual was happening to them. Peter explain to the believers scattered throughout Asia Minor in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. He said, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Paul assures them that this is just the way it's going to be. After all, Jesus prepared his disciples for this as we read in John chapter 16 when he said, All this I've told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. The Thessalonians were experiencing just what Jesus and Peter and Paul said they would. And from their own countrymen, this word, 
countryman, doesn't appear anywhere else in our New Testaments, and doesn't refer to the Gentile unbelievers who were in part responsible for the persecution they were going through. It was the unbelieving Jews who were the primary instigators of the persecution, just as it was in and around Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, it was the Jews who presented the greatest opposition because the population was predominantly Jewish. In Thessalonica, a mostly Gentile city, the unbelieving Jews would find some pretext to incite the Gentiles against the Christians, typically by spreading rumors that they had declared war against the culture in general and government institutions in particular. This had been the case in Thessalonica, where, as Luke tells us in Acts chapter 17, verse 5, the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them, being Paul and Silas, out to the crowd. And when they couldn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason's received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And nobody knew better than Paul how vicious the unbelieving Jews could be, having once been one of them himself. Now, Paul celebrates their joyful endurance through suffering that marked their identity with him and the Lord. In spite of the intense opposition, Paul recognizes their joy produced by the indwelling, uh, indwelling presence and assurance of the Holy Spirit, who is the seal of their salvation. It was their persecution by the Jews that marked their authenticity as a true Christian church. And Paul celebrates that as a confirmation of their genuine faith. In verses 15 and 16, Paul adds to his charges against the unbelieving Jews who persecuted the churches in Judea and incited persecution against the churches in Gentile lands by saying they were the ones who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. These are very strong words from the same apostle who would, just a few years later, tell the Christians in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. To be sure, Paul was proud of his Jewish ancestry. It was better to him than any earthly acclaim. He rejoiced as he considered in Romans chapter 9, verse 4, that to the Jews belong the adoption as sons. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. There's are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all forever praised. Even though he was known as the apostles of the Gentiles, he had great sorrow and incessant pain in his heart when he remembered the unbelieving Jews' fierce rejection of the gospel. Still, he was confident that in some glorious future they would yet recognize Jesus as the Messiah so that all Israel should be saved. He believed that the turning of the heathen to God would provoke them to jealousy and God's calling of Abraham and the promises given to him would one day be fulfilled. But that time had not yet come. So here, in his first letter to the followers of Christ in Thessalonica, he looks at his countrymen from a different perspective. They had demonstrated a violent resistance to the gospel and had bitterly persecuted the church of Christ. They had hunted Paul and would continue to pursue him from city to city in Asia and in Europe, and they had incited the citizens of so many places he visited against him and his converts. He knows that what they have done is consistent with what they've done for centuries to the prophets and others who call the people to the true heart of their own faith. In verse 15, Paul places the crowning sin of the Jewish race in the forefront. They killed the Lord Jesus. Before that, they had killed the Lord's prophets. God had put them in a position of great privilege, a privilege that came with great responsibility. 
They were the trustees, the stewards of the knowledge of God's plan for salvation. But instead of sharing that good news with all of humanity through faith, they held firm to their own self-righteousness. The words of Stephen, the first martyr, echo through this passage. When at his trial before the Jewish leaders, he told them, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels but have not obeyed it. Luke then tells us, when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the sound of the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, Luke says, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. As a result of what they had done, Paul says, they are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. An ominous indictment is indeed, especially when Paul adds in the next verse that these unbelieving Jews have hindered him and his fellow workers from sharing the gospel with the Gentiles so that they could be saved. To say that they are not pleasing to God is what one scholar calls the studiously restrained and smooth expression covering intense feeling. In other words, Paul is telling the Thessalonians that the unbelieving Jews' interference with sharing the gospel achieves the very opposite of that which would be pleasing to God. God is not pleased to the greatest extreme. The Jews' hostility to all men was well documented by several writers who lived in that first century A.D. The Roman historian Tacitus described them as cherishing hatred against all others. Juvenal, a famous Roman poet, wrote that they would not even point out the way to anyone except to the same religion, nor being asked, guide any to a fountain except the circumcised. Apollonius, a Christian member of the Roman Senate, called them atheists and malcontents and the most uncultivated barbarians. The Greek historian Diodorus Siculus describes them as those alone among all the nations who were unwilling to have any contact with any other nation and who regarded all the others as enemies. Paul was right about how they were seen by the people of his day. The consequence of all this is that they always fill up the measure of their sins. In chapter 23 of Matthew's gospel, Jesus pronounced seven woes upon the Jewish leaders of that day. Near the conclusion of these crushing pronouncements, he tells them in verse 32, fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. Throughout their long and tragic history, the Jews had been adding to their sins, adding their sins to the cup of God's wrath, slowly filling it one drop at a time. Once that cup was full, God's wrath would pour out upon his people. Now for each and every unbelieving Jew who had not pleased God, who had proven to be hostile to all men, and who had hindered Paul and his fellow workers from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved, their cup was now full. And the wrath stored up for them would finally come, as he says at the end of verse 16. So Paul says, wrath has come upon them to the utmost. They have always been adding to this cup. Now it's full. Their forbidding the apostles to preach to the Gentiles was the last drop that finally caused the cup of their iniquity to overflow. In the year 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem fell after what one scholar calls the most dreadful and calamitous siege known in history. Even so, the destruction of Jerusalem was but the outward expression of God's displeasure with them. The individual judgment for their sin was set but it was yet to come. Paul would later write to the Roman Christians in chapter 1, verse 18, that the wrath of God is even now being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And these opponents of the gospel had been suppressing the truth by their wickedness. A solemn epitaph indeed. 
for the unbelieving Jews. Remember, though, that Paul's purpose in telling the Thessalonian believers about this was to remind them that, as one scholar puts it, much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost is the very badge of God's elect. And here he combines the same stern necessity with the operation of the divine word in their hearts. Do not let us overlook this, he says. The work is God's word. The work of God's word is, in the first instant, to produce a new character, a character not only distinct from that of the unconverted, but antagonistic to it, and more directly and inevitably antagonistic the more thoroughly it is wrought out, so that in proportion as God's Word is operative in us, we come into collision with the world that rejects it. To suffer, therefore, is to the apostle the seal of faith. It reveals the genuineness of a Christian profession. It's not a sign that God has forgotten His people, but a sign that He is with them, and they are being brought by Him into fellowship with the earliest churches, with apostles and prophets, and with the incarnate Son Himself. And hence, he says, the whole situation of the Thessalonians, suffering included, comes under the heartfelt expression of thanks to God with which the passage opens. It's not a subject for condolence, but for gratitude that they have been counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. In verse 17, Paul shifts gears to an entirely new subject, leading some scholars to suggest that perhaps a new chapter should have begun here. In the last three verses of our focal text for today, Paul tells the followers of Christ in Thessalonica about his great desire to visit them. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. At this point in Paul's travels, he had only been away from Thessalonica about six months, yet he speaks with such longing to see them again. It's quite possible that when Paul was sent away to Berea, he believed things would settle down and he could safely return to Thessalonica. But that wasn't to be. There were other factors that kept him from returning. Paul wants them to know that although he's been absent from them physically, he still feels their fellowship and communion with him in his heart. His sentiments were similar to those he shared with the believers in Colossae when he told them in chapter 2, verse 5, Though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. It's quite clear that Paul's absence from them had only increased his great desire to see them again soon. One commentator marvels at the intense passion of Paul's words after, after having known the believers in Thessalonica for only a few weeks before he was forced to leave. He writes, Here we ought to notice again the power of the gospel to create new relations and the corresponding affections. A few months before, Paul had not known a single soul in Thessalonica. If he had been only a traveling tent maker, he might have stayed there as long as he did and then moved on with as little emotion as troubles a modern gypsy when he moves his camp. But coming as a Christian evangelist, he finds or rather makes brothers and feels his enforced parting from them like a bereavement. Months after, his heart is sore for those whom he has left behind. This is one of the ways in which the gospel enriches life. Hearts that would otherwise be empty and isolated are brought by it into living contact with a great circle of other believers whose nature and needs are like their own. Only the Christian man or woman can ever tell what it is to love with all his heart and soul and strength and mind. He goes on to add, Such an experience as shines through the words of the apostle in this passage furnishes the key to one of the best known but least understood words of our Savior, found in Luke chapter 18, verse 29, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one 
who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. He writes, these words might almost stand for a description of Paul. He had given up everything for Christ's sake. He had no home, no wife, no child. As far as we can see, no brother or friend among his old acquaintances. Yet we may be sure that not one of those who are most richly blessed with all these natural relations and natural affections knew better than he what love truly is. No father ever loved his children more tenderly, fervently, austerely, and unchangeably than Paul loved those whom he had led to the new birth in the gospel. No father was ever rewarded with affection more genuine, obedience more loyal than many of his converts rendered to him. If love, he says, is the true wealth and blessedness of our life, surely none was richer or more blessed than this man who had given up for Christ's sake all those relations and connections through which love naturally comes. Christ had fulfilled to him the promise just quoted. He had given him a hundredfold in this life, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children. It would have been nothing but loss to cling to the natural affections and thus hinder the lonely apostolic career. In verse 18, Paul lets them know that he dearly wanted to return to Thessalonica on several occasions, but there was a problem. Satan, he said, hindered us. As we suggested earlier, there may have been some of his critics who said Paul was afraid to return or that he'd just given up on the believers there, leaving them to get along as best they could. He makes it clear that such was not the case. Satan had hindered him. How exactly Satan hindered, hindered him, we, we don't know. Somehow, though, Paul recognized the hand of the author of all evil and the great opponent of God and Christ and the accuser of the brethren, frustrating his attempts to personally encourage them in their spiritual growth and development and enjoy the blessed fellowship with these dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul doesn't attribute this hindrance to something accidental or inconvenient, but a strong, personal, spiritual struggle that he had to deal with. He understood the powerful force of evil wielded by Satan. When Paul shared his testimony before King Agrippa, as we read in the book of Acts chapter 26, he told the king about his encounter with the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. He says that part of what Jesus told him was, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul speaks to married couples about faithfulness. In verse 5, he writes, Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Speaking of the necessity of forgiving an erring brother or sister, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his, of his schemes. Later, in chapter 11, Paul warned the followers of Christ in Corinth that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Twice, Paul speaks of turning an unrepentant person over to Satan, and he refers to Satan with such titles as, as the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Paul well understood how Satan operated, and he easily recognized his handiwork in hindering him from returning to Thessalonica in a timely manner. Yet the painful recollection of Satan's interference quickly fades as his heart overflows to those he describes as his hope and joy and crown of glorying in the day of the Lord Jesus, verse 9. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Paul celebrates the fact that the followers of Christ in Thessalonica 
or his hope, his joy, or his crown of exaltation, or as the New International Version translates it, our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. These are words of high praise indeed. The believers in Thessalonica are first his hope that he will glory in when Jesus comes. Their conversion and the way they had continued to grow in their faith was one of the proofs of his hope of eternal life. Now, you might wonder how their salvation encouraged Paul in his expectation of spending eternity in heaven. As he reflected on how their reception of the gospel came with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, he went on to add that they became imitators of him and his fellow workers and Jesus. In spite of severe suffering, they welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit and became models to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. They turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So Paul looks at how faithfully and victoriously the Thessalonian believers are living, and he's filled with the assurance that he had been a faithful witness of God and would be rewarded for his faithfulness in heaven as he sees the saints he has helped lead to faith in Christ at his return. They would also be his source of joy in this life as wherever he went, he heard the thrilling stories of their faith, their love, and their hope, not only in this life, but in heaven as he celebrated their salvation now made complete with them around the throne of God they would be a source of joy for him. They would be his hope, his joy, and his crown of rejoicing. Like a champion who rejoiced as he was crowned with a wreath at the Olympic Games, so Paul rejoiced in the authentic and consistent outworking of their faith. In all three of these ideas, Paul is imagining the realization of the goal of his labors as he wrote to the followers of Christ in Colossae in chapter 1, verse 28, that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. As one commentator puts it, when Paul looked down into the future, as he anticipated his declining years, he, he saw no fortune growing secretly, no peaceful retirement in which the love of sons and daughters would surround him and call him blessed. Yet his future was not dreary or desolate. It was bright with a great light. He had a hope that made life abundantly worth living. And that hope was the Thessalonians. He saw them in his mind's eye grow daily out of the lingering taint of heathenism into the purity and love of Christ. He saw them as the discipline of God's providence had its perfect work in them escape from the immaturity of babes in Christ and grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior to the full measure of the stature of a perfect man. He saw them presented faultless, in the presence of the Lord's glory in the great day. That was something to live for. To witness that spiritual transformation which he had inaugurated, carried on to completion, gave the future a greatness and a worth which made the apostle's heart leap for joy. He's glad when he thinks of his children walking in the truth. He is more proud of them than a king of his crown or a champion in the games of his wreath. We might well be surprised at these words were it not for the fact that he says this hope, his joy, and the crown in which he and his fellow workers would glory would come at the return of the Lord Jesus. When the Lord Jesus appears at the end of the age, then his greatest and highest source of happiness and honor would be their conversion and their salvation in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. The word we have translated here as coming is possibly to you the well-known Greek word parousia, a word used to refer to a royal visit and here applied to the coming of the Messiah. All the word was rarely used in pre-Christian Judaism, it would become a common and familiar reference to Jesus' second coming because of Paul's and Jesus' use of the word. In Matthew chapter 24, we read that Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? Jesus asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? 
And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? In his answer, Jesus told his disciples in verse 36, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So this is the first time Paul used this word in any of his letters, but apparently it was already very familiar to his readers in Thessalonica. Because the believers there were eagerly expecting the soon return of the Lord Jesus, Paul speaks of the parousia several times in his letters to them, as we'll see later. Finally, in verse 20, how does Paul describe them as he looks forward with such hope, joy, or the crown in which he will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? He says, you are our glory and joy. As an ambassador of Christ, as a minister of the gospel, as an evangelist for the kingdom of heaven, what greater joy could he have had than to see the precious souls that he had led to Christ present with the Lord when he returned? Each and every person he had prayed with to receive Christ, every lost soul he had led to the foot of the cross, every rebel he had led to consider his or her eternal destiny and was convicted of sin and the need for Christ would be there to join with him in casting their crowns before the throne of glory and declaring with all creation that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And all the pain from persecution and accusations and sacrifice and separation and worry about how these believers had fared since he last saw them will be swept away in the twinkling of an eye in that precious moment when they all see Jesus face to face. He knows he will see them there or in the air. And he knows what a day of rejoicing that will be. Such was Paul's confidence in God's work among them and the eager anticipation of their joyful reunion when the Lord called them home. We also should have the same joy and desire for those we've won to Christ with a longing to see even more place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. Thank you for being a part of our survey of Paul's first letter to these amazing disciples of Christ in Thessalonica whose lives radiated with faith, love, and hope as they lived in eager expectation for the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next week, we turn to chapter 3, where we'll hear how Paul dealt with his separation from them and celebrated the news he received. As always, as it's still a good thing to do, keep calm, trust the Lord, and wash your hands. God bless you.